again, everyone, and welcome to Reform Yinzers. Hey, hey, Yins guys just need to cool down and cut it out. Beloved, anybody who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, if they understand it at all, would rather die than to compromise. Welcome to Reform Yinzers. We got a rowdy one today, man. I'm hype about this. Christ is king. Who could, who could debate that? I hope no Christians debate it. Let's go, man. Uh, I, I want to introduce my guest, Nathan Anderson, man. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, brother. Thanks for having me. Man, thanks for coming on, man. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to have you on, man. Uh, and I told you off air, man, I watched uh, On Earth as it, is, as it Is in Heaven, your documentary, like five times over the last two years and sending out, man. It's, it's powerful, motivating, I think ultimately is God's truth. It's, 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 it's biblical, a biblical view. And we're talking about that post mill, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, let's, let's talk about that first. The two projects that you're involved with, at least that, that I know of is yeah. on earth as it is in heaven, a documentary on, um, the post millennial view of eschatology. And then, Teach the Nations on Lore TV, man. Talk about that real quick, and then we'll get into some questions. Yeah, so I, I uh, produced the first documentary, On Earth As It Is In Heaven. Um, started filming it, working on it back in uh, mostly 2019. Um, yeah, launched it in early 2020, actually, right when uh, things were starting to get a little little crazy uh in the world well right before actually i launched it on february 15th uh 2020 so just about a month later is when everything uh kind of went crazy at least down here where where we are yeah um and so yeah so let's um launch that that movie and um then the same year basically uh 2020 i went out and started filming a second project called teach all nations um on earth as it is in heaven is as you mentioned a documentary on the post-millennial hope the the post-millennial view of eschatology kind of explaining it presenting it talking a little bit about my own journey um to that that perspective and teach all nations is basically a follow-up project to that that first one and it kind of answers the question i think well, you know, if if it is true that, you know, um, the world isn't ending tomorrow, if it is yeah. true that we might be around here for a while, what what do we do now? I mean, what right. how should we then live, you know, right, uh, right, right. in that sense? Um, and so um, that's what I, you know, try to discuss in uh, in this second project, just how do we deal with the chaos going on around us yeah. in, in our country and all over the world? Um, and how do we, uh, you know, move forward and be salt and light in these uh, difficult times, I right. guess. Right, right. Yeah, like I said, man, we'll come back to that. But it's like we'll come we'll come full circle at the end and come back to the post mill stuff because, man, it, it, it's motivating to me. And uh, like like Jesus said, he got all authority in heaven and on earth. And like, Amen. like so that's of every realm of of what you can think of your life is it we can just make it real practical for your own life think about every area of your life christ is king now go take dominion with preach the gospel and live as salt and light it's just motivating man and and like i said i appreciate you doing it man and uh so just a little bit about yourself like where you where do you live man because i thought that that was interesting man yeah yeah so i live in chile in in south america and i've lived here my whole life pretty much my parents uh, were originally from california yeah but moved down to chile when i was um about eight months old wow um, so yeah so we we've lived here i live in a small coastal town called pichilemu on a, a few hours uh from the capital and yeah we we like it here um, serve in our our local church, um, and uh, yeah, that, cool. I, that's where where we're we're based. 
So how did you how did you come to Christ? Tell me that story. Like how did you become a Christian? Yeah, so well my my parents would probably be the mo the main, you know, at least in terms of earthly uh the way God is the people that God has used my parents have been greatly used by God to to bring me to Christ and to uh, present to me the gospel and um, and my need for a savior. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I grew up in a in a Christian family. Um, I I you know um, went through you know different uh, phases like like everybody I guess, and um, ultimately um, put my trust in Christ and have been following Him uh, for for many years now. Wow. So explain the gospel message to me that that you came to believe in that your parents preached just for the listeners and for me. I like to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Wow. Well, the gospel is uh, the message of the of of the um, death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ that um we are sinners we are fallen sons and daughters of adam Mm -hmm. and uh you know when when adam sins sinned we all fell in him and we are under the the curse of sin and death because of that but you know god right from the beginning right from the fall um had a he had set forth a plan to redeem us right he he right. he gave us a redeemer in Christ the seed of the woman who would come and uh and, and destroy the seed of the serpent ultimately right. as we see in Genesis um, chapter 3 and that obviously um God set a, a, a people apart for himself throughout history ultimately leading up to the coming of Christ and um, his sacrificing um, himself on the cross for the sins of his people. And through him as our only mediator, we are saved from our sin. And we are saved to then um, live out those good works, right, that God has established for us to to walk in as it says in ephesians right so yeah ultimately that's uh, you know i guess we we could uh describe it in in, in different ways and and the, the gospel is kind of like like a diamond in that sense is where you 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 move it a little bit and you see different yeah. aspects of it you know right uh, but yeah ultimately the gospel is about the death burial and resurrection of of jesus and him um, giving his life for his people on the cross and rising again on the third day, right, to reign mm-hmm. today and forever um, uh, at the right hand of the Father. That's right. And, and that's where he is today, and, we, we, um, and he will come back again one day for his people. Amen, amen. And uh, the, like you said, the diamond in, in Ephesians when he said, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. So we'll constantly mm-hmm. be looking at the gospel, what Christ has done in heaven, and it's so glorious, it's incomparable riches. Like you, can, you, can, you can't, you'll never get bored of thinking about what he's done for us in his grace. Man, it's crazy. Amen. <laughs> mm. It's crazy. It's crazy. So how did, are your parents reformed or how did you come to the reformed faith? No, my parents are uh, more of a, a Pentecostal background. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so I came to reform theology. I guess, you know, not thinking about it, probably uh, about maybe 10 years ago started, uh, I I think it was you know some of my first introduction to reform theology was listening to to James White talking yeah, yeah. about um, um, Calvinism and mm-hmm. um, and in in fact it's it's interesting because that my first introduction to James White was listening to a debate uh, between him and Steve Gregg who's actually also in my in my film uh, yeah. but it wasn't about des- eschatology it was about Calvinism and oh, so. Wow. 
Uh, so Steve Gregg's an Arminian and, and James White's uh, obviously a Calvinist. And so they uh, were debating that subject. And, and um, so that was my introduction to uh, James White. And then I started listening to his show. And, and also just um, on the other hand, I think being introduced to presuppositional apologetics. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, listening to, I, I remember, um, Westminster seminary had, um, Van Til's lectures on apologetics, um, a, a long time ago in iTunes U. And I remember listening through that series of, uh, Van Til and, and so I didn't come maybe directly through the issue of, 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 you know, kind of reformed theology. I kind of uh, came in on uh, a little bit on the subject of eschatology, a little bit on the subject of apologetics, and then ended up becoming convinced of the doctrines of grace um, along the way. Amen. Amen. Now, who is your favorite post-millennial church history guy? Like who, who influenced you in that way? Like the old dead guy? Well, that's a good question. I mean, lately, um, especially lately, I've been reading and, uh, and 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 checking out some older authors um, and on post millennialism. Um, and so, I, I think BB Warfield has been very interesting lately to oh, wow. to read what what he had to say on the subject of of post millennialism. I didn't know um, he was. I didn't know that. Wow, wow. I oh yeah, BB Warfield is. Very post millennial. Nice. Um, and, and That's so, a good guy yeah, to have on the team. De- <laughs> oh, most definitely. <laughs> In fact, um, you know, there's a a, a good article because the other thing about Warfield is that like it's it's a lot of his work and his his stuff, especially on post millennialism, is kind of broken up into shorter articles and. It's not like you, it, it's it's not so much like oh well you know Warfield's book on postmillennialism it's like broken up into uh, his writings but one interesting article that's very relevant to people that are considering postmillennialism or mm-hmm. or that issue is I think it's called um, shall few be saved or something like yeah. that and so it's talking about the number of the of the saved and and. Uh, that article is very good by by Warfield and would be a great one for folks to uh, check out and, and interested in this subject because because that's just one of those one of those issues that are kind of macro issues when you're considering it's uh, you know this this just it, these aspects of eschatology like does the Bible teach that most people are gonna end up in hell or does the Bible teach that most people will be saved? And, mm. uh, and, and to me, that's always been one of those questions um, that really t- defines when I talk to people is like, well, is, is, is this person convinced of post-millennialism or are they not? Cause I've talked to people who are like, well, I'm kind of a post-millennialist or I'm a non-millennialist and I'm not, I'm not really sure. And I, and usually ask them, okay, do you think that most you know, when we we add up the number of all mm-hmm. all the sons and of Adam and daughters of Eve, when we add up all those people, will most of them end up separated from God eternally, or will most of them be saved? And uh, if they say, "Well, most are going to be lost," then that's they're not post millennial. Right. Ultimately, I, I think you know, and right. so uh, Warfield. Come, you know, really addresses that issue very well, and a number of other issues um, related to yeah, that, right? Um, and and the subject. But yeah, he was a a great defender of postmillennialism, as were many of the um, professors in uh, from Princeton for the, the old Princeton Seminary. Yeah, um, the Hodges, A. A. Hodge, and Charles Hodge. Um, I think that another one I've been checking out lately is Jay Alexander com- and, and his his comments on, uh, uh, you know, on, on the Psalms and on Isaiah, yeah. uh, another very interesting post-millennial uh, co- commentary. And so, yeah, the, the, I, I, for me, it's been very interesting to um, read and, and look into a lot of the folks associated with the old Princeton Seminary and in terms of their post-millennial view. And do you I think, think that there's a, a lot to glean there? Do you think that's a result of Jonathan Edwards being at Princeton and his because I know 
he was post mill. And so he then he he started Princeton, didn't he? If I'm if, um, or he took I, over I as president. He's... Yeah, my bad. Yeah, he, I think he started he took over I, as I, president. I I'm not wrong, sure. I th- I know he was I'm pretty sure Edwards was president of Yale. At okay, one point. I messed up my uh, uh, my uh, um, Ivy League. I don't school. remember, <laughs> but but you're, I know the Hodges right. had a, a lot to do with. But you know, um, one one um, historian said basically that post millennialism was you know pretty much I think in like the from the eighteen like the seventeen hundreds and the eighteen hundreds, especially in North America, post millennialism mm-hmm. was a pretty standard view um here or or in, in the united states and in in england and so it wasn't um that strange mm-hmm. for people to be post-millennial because most people were i mean and when you start looking into famous preachers from that period yeah i mean a lot of them were i mean you think of someone like you know not even even outside of uh kind of the the the, the reform camp i mean you think of like john wesley for example, yeah. the Wesley brothers were both post-millennial. Oh, wow. I didn't um, know that either. Uh, yeah, you think of George <laughs> Whitfield was, was post-millennial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you you know, a, a lot of the famous preachers from that, that, that period um, embraced that, that hope, you know? Yeah. And so, um, so it was very common, I would say, uh, as far as I can tell, at least. Okay, cool. So... I'm probably going to send this out to people that are mostly pre-mill. So, uh-huh. real, so you want to give a brief explanation of the pre-mill view, and then maybe our mill. But I want, I definitely want to get in the post mill, like you know what I mean, and pretty much yeah, as much as we can. But what's a give me a brief overview of the three aspects of it. Yeah, so the you know generally the way that this um, issue is presented is um, there's you know three views that and all carry all speak of the millennium, which is a reference to Revelation chapter twenty and where it mentions a thousand year reign of Christ um, with his saints, right? And mm-hmm. so basically, uh, the names for these views follow how people. Um, view that passage and and where they place that millennium mentioned there. Mm-hmm. So we have the um, premillennial view that believes that Christ will return and will inaugurate this thousand year reign on earth, and that he will be reigning on earth before the final consummation, before. Uh, you know, the eternal state and the the final judgment, that is after this thousand-year reign Mm -hmm. of Christ physically on earth. So that's the premillennial view. Then there's the amillennial view, and an amillennialism, uh, ah means um, basically, you know, no millennium, uh, ultimately. That's that's the name. And obviously they would say, no, we don't believe that there's no millennium, but we don't believe in an earthly millennium. Basically, right. so all millennialists would either say that Christ is uh, reigning currently from heaven, and that the millennium is happening in heaven. So there is a millennium, but it's in heaven. Mm-hmm. And uh, on the other hand, or Christ, the millennium is in the heart of of His people. You know, but that basically this millennium is occurring between the first and second coming of Christ. That this whole period. Yeah. Uh, in between is when that is happening, but there's no period of prosperity on the earth per se uh, for God's people um, that is expected. There's no golden age right. um, um, until the eternal state, until the second coming, and and everything is made new after that. And the post millennial view yeah. is. Uh, in that sense, it, it is the view that Christ will return after the millennium. And, and in a lot of ways, especially today, most post-millennialists have a pretty similar view in terms of interpreting the millennium to amillennialists. It's not all that different for the most part. Um, but the difference is that post-millennialists have an expectation 
of for for uh, on earth before Christ returns for the gospel to be successful for the nations to be discipled for the nations to be christianized to convert to to christianity and right. and for the earth to be filled with the knowledge of the lord as the waters cover the sea and so we expect <laughs> all that to happen in history Amen. right Amen. and and that's the the major difference that's actually a, a difference uh, th that's what differentiates postmillennialism from both awe and premillennialism, because both of them believe that um, nothing like that will happen until um, Christ returns. And so, even though there are differences between pre and amillennialists, mm -hmm. they are in agreement when it comes to the issue of the state of the church in the present age. And where they believe that the church will be um, in the present age will be a minority, um, that the nations, even though there will be the the presence of Christianity in different places, ultimately Satan and his minions are going to have the upper hand in the nations, mm -hmm. right? That the nations will remain in in his grasp. Even though there are, and though there will be you know small pockets of resistance and the church will be in these different places, the church will will never um, ha be superior in numbers to to the enemy um, until Christ returns, right? Mm -hmm. And so whether that be Christ returns and begins a millennium, as in the case of the premillennialists, or whether Christ returns and the eternal state begins, either way, uh, the present age is an evil age from their perspective and w even if the gospel grows in the world in the present age the kingdom of satan grows faster yeah. in the current age so that's the di that's the and i think for me um that's really the heart of the matter it's not so much about interpreting this or that Same. little yep. bit of revelation 20 it's about what is our expectation for the church Right. Um, is it to be victorious in the present age through difficulties and suffering, but ultimately to win before Christ returns? Or mm -hmm. is the church simply going to be a uh, minority, a, a, a small remnant in a world given over to Satan, and only the second coming of Christ um, will change that? So that, that those are, to me, that's where the, the heart of the debate is on this yeah. subject. Amen, man. Like you're making me rowdy. I'm getting rowdy, man. Like e even even a verse that people use, and I usually use it personally for myself. Like Romans eight twenty eight, and you know that all things God works for the good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. Mm -hmm. But that all things, even the hard times, is COVID. It's because of COVID. I was sitting in my garage, able to watch your <laughs> documentaries so many times. But it, it, that's right. When when this when the when the government tries to fight against the Lord and His Messiah, like it says in Psalm two, He sits in the heavens and laughs because you're working against. He's He's causing people to pain, but that that makes the gospel thrive. When people are down, you got the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and that's what I. And and you can go to the cross for that. Like the Satan thought he won when they killed Christ. It, it infinitely backfired on you and the whole cosmos has been changed because he raised from the dead and now he reigns victoriously right now so if that still happens now what satan means for evil god uses for good and ten thousand years from now we'll all see it <laughs> we'll see it as like on earth as it is in heaven or like abraham's promises the sand mm. of the seas and the stars of the skies. That's that's motivation, man. That's motivation. Mm. That's right. Yeah, I remember um, Greg Bonson in his book on on postmillennialism yeah. said something that was very interesting because he because sometimes it's it's falsely claimed that postmillennialists they just believe everything's just just going to be great and you're you're not going to you know it's, right. it's almost like a version of the prosperity gospel you know everything's just yeah. going to be good and no problems in this world is you're going to live an easy life and that's that's what god's that's god's plan for you or something like that mm -hmm. but no we believe there is suffering 
in history. And mm-hmm. um, uh, and what 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 Bonson said is, look, I mean, we're in a war, right? And in a war, everybody suffers, yeah. right? I mean, he he used the example of the Second World War. He's like, you know, the the Germans suffered and the Allies suffered. You know, everyone mm-hmm. was suffering, right? right? People lost fathers and and all this. But the the only the question was who won, right? Right. right and so, right. like, were you suffering? Like in this case of the 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 Nazis, were you suffering to then lose, mm-hmm. right? Or are you suffering, and then that does that suffering lead to victory? That's the question. Mm-hmm. So we all acknowledge that there's suffering in this world. We all acknowledge that Christians suffer, right. and that you know the, the church can go through hard times. But we our claim is that what, going through hard times ultimately the church will be victorious over all of Christ's enemies. That's what we're claiming. That's right. And a lot of people will say, well, yeah, in a sense, but but it but for Christ, but the victory Christ wants for the church is the church to be defeated in history, but then Christ is going to come at the last minute and kind of uh, you know, do the touchdown and and change the whole result of the game. But, you know, I ask myself, well, why would that be so? I mean, Christ told his church to go and disciple the nations right christ gave the church the holy spirit Mm -hmm. who's the third person of the trinity god dwells with us but somehow that isn't enough to (laughs) uh, transform the nations that's that's just not that's not the the we you know the third person of the trinity isn't enough you know whoa Uh, we need the second person to come back and only then can the church, you know, be victorious over Satan and his minions here in in history? So, right. I think, yeah, there's 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 a number of assumptions that we've bought into, I believe, Amen. Um, that just simply aren't biblical and aren't in line with what you know the the scriptures uh, present to us, and not just in a verse here or there. I mean, you go through the Old Testament, you see the promises yeah. of what will happen with the coming of the the messiah you read psalm 72 right yeah. or 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 even psalm 22 which we would all agree is speaking of yeah. right the sufferings of christ you know right. when christ cries out on the cross you know my god my god why have you forsaken me mm-hmm. right and and at the end of that psalm after after all that suffering mm-hmm. you know it says all the ends of the earth will turn to the lord amen and and that's the result of that uh, and 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 so that is our expectation our expectation are the promises of god in scripture that right. line up with the very command of christ of, to his disciples to go out and disciple the nations right and and so um that w- i think is what really different differentiates post-millennialism from a lot of the other views is that we expect uh the gospel and and the uh, to be successful in history yes. not just after history not just when christ returns in that sense right i got a couple verses i sent to a pre mill buddy of mine he knows who he is but i want to get your thoughts on this and then i want to talk about vocation because that is what the second second episode of teach all nations was but then i heard you know matt truella down in in wisconsin uh-huh he, yeah. This Sunday he preached on vocation too, and he I'm pretty sure he's post mill. I'm pretty sure. If not, yeah. he he sounds like it. <laughs> but listen to this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he is. <laughs> amen. Amen. So Psalm one ten one. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put all your enemies under your feet. What's that sound like? Where's Christ seated right now? You know what I mean? And he's putting all his enemies under his feet. How? by his church, by the power of the spirit, by the proclamation of gospel, them being salt and light. And then, what is it? Hold on. Matthew, I think it's 13, no, 16. He said, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, and I tell you, Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Like, gates are on defense, the Christians are on offense. We don't. We don't have to pass the ball. We got the ball, man. And and and, and, he's, mm. and it's a promise that he's not that the gates are not gonna prevail. 
And then you could go to the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. And then at the end, he sandwiches, like you said, the Holy Spirit. I'll be with you always, even till the end of the age. Mm. That don't sound like we're going to lose. And then one more, man. Um, what is it? 1 Corinthians 15, 25. It's, it's, it sounds a lot like Psalm 110. 1. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Like, mm. Christ doesn't plan on losing now. I don't know. It's not biblical to think we're going to lose, Johnny Mac. I'm sorry. I disagree with you. <laughs> I agree we with you. We don't lose down line. here. <laughs> no, man. He, look, the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. If it's a war, mm. we got the most powerful weapon, the resurrected Lord right. who we're united to and his, the same spirit that raised him is in us. And he ain't give us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. I, matter of fact, just to make it real personal, when you're talking about suffering, and I don't want to make it about me, but it's it's evident in my own life. Like I'm going through health stuff now, or the last two last year, I'm going through cancer twice. But this has been the most fruit my, fruitful my life has ever been, mm. because Christ is King. I'm united to Him, and it, it just made me focus on Him more. When persecution comes, the church looks to Christ more. When you martyred people mm. in church history, what happened? You caused, you just made a hundred more Christians. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Yeah, the blood of the martyrs is the seat of the church. Yeah, man. So, yeah, anything to and, add to that, bro? Yeah, I, I think, I think the, mis I, I think a, a major mistake people make sometimes in discussing this, and that they, they'll say, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, the church does grow. Christ is growing His church, and uh, mm -hmm. no one's denying that. Mm -hmm. But the kingdom of darkness is also growing. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a bit of a problem with that because, um, well, for one, there's there's no neutrality. Right. right. And so right. there's 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 those two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of Christ and there's the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. And, every, you know, they're not both just pulling from this neutral right. group of, of people. Right. They're being transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so every time Christ's kingdom advances, the enemy's kingdom retreats, right? That's right. That's right. And so the, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's not this thing where it's, you know, kind of like the stock market where, oh, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, sometimes Christ wins, sometimes Satan wins, and there's just this up and down through history. Mm -hmm. And it, it is as long as the church is advancing, as long as the gospel is being preached, the enemy's camp is shrinking, right? right. And we, and that's just, I mean, we, we see that throughout history. I mean, when you go, when you compare the numbers just of people who were Christian, like um, in the, the first century to the, the number of people that, you know, at least claim to be Christians today, we're talking about almost a third of the world now is is Christian, right? Uh, or at least claim to be Christian. I mean, that's amazing when you mm -hmm. when you think of, uh, you know, Jesus in the upper room with a few of his disciples, or yeah. when you think of Peter's first sermon, where 3000 people were saved, and that was like, wow, look at how many people have come into the kingdom, right? Um, in that sense it's and, and so i have a big problem with this idea of well it's just you know christ kingdom grows satan kingdom grows and then it just is up and down up and down and and it's just kind of a almost a zero-sum game you know right um it, in the end um i believe that the direction that history flows is towards the kingdom of christ and that that it, as time goes on the kingdom of satan is diminished Right. And the kingdom of Christ grows, right? Right. And now, at the same time, even though the kingdom of Satan is diminished, that doesn't mean that it he that it can't lash out and it can't cause damage, right? Right. And and, and in one way, the more Satan's kingdom shrinks, the more violent and um, you know, it, it, it's it's like a cornered animal, basically. You know, right. the, the when Satan knows that he has little time left. 
he he will even be more violent in, against the, the the kingdom of Christ in that sense. And so um, that doesn't mean that Satan and his minions can't cause a lot of damage, but it does mean that it, the direction and the flow of history is the expansion of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan shrinking. I mean, think about it. When before Christ came to this world, all the nations of the world worshipped demons, basically. <laughs> That's right. The only the only nation that didn't was was Israel, and even they yeah. fell into idolatry all yeah. the time. Right. And now the gospel has gone out into all the nations of the world, and so it's just objectively true that that Christianity has grown throughout history. You know, yeah. uh, there's there's a very interesting book by a guy who isn't even a Christian, who's uh, Tom Holland, called uh, Dominion. Mm -hmm. um, that just tells the story of, of, of Christianity and how it's just grown all over mm -hmm. the world and how right. so many of our assum of, of the assumption people people have today weren't just neutral assumptions. They came from Christianity right. in that sense. And right. so um, so it's an undeniable fact that the kingdom of Christ in the last 2,000 years has grown tremendously and that the kingdom of satan has been retreating mm -hmm. for two thousand years and technology is only making it better you i can talk to you from chile and preach and talk about christ we would have never met right uh 10 years ago <laughs> you know what i'm saying we couldn't mm. do this we wouldn't have this technology so we're not losing and i would i, I thought about this on the drive up here in in progressive personal sanctification you got your ups and downs but ultimately you're being made more and more like christ by the spirit but that's the same thing as far as collective church growth in christianity yeah there's ups and downs but eventually we're going to win it's going to keep growing that's what sanctification is and that's what i think the the, the main idea of the post-millennial position is uh, we we play the long game because the wealth of the riches is laid up for the righteous, stored up for the righteous. We'll take your stuff eventually. <laughs> that's right. That's so, right. The... Like you said, uh, take dominion. And that's something I think it was Gary North on the last episode where he said um, one of the first commandments is be fruitful and multiply and take dominion. Then the flood happened. And he's, he repeated it after the flood. So yeah. we are to take dominion and think about all of life, not just in the four walls of the church, because we are the church. The spirit is in us wherever mm -hmm. we go, whether your vocation, whether you're playing sports, whether no matter what you're doing, take dominion, that, that all of it belongs to Jesus Christ. Now, be mm -hmm. filled with the Spirit and do the job He's given you to do with the skills He's given you for the glory of Christ. That's how we win. We don't stay mm -hmm. in the building. We go. Go, therefore. Now, yeah, talk yeah. about that side. Like, all of, all of it. all The whole vocational recreation, all of it. All of that side, real quick, man. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, a lot of the focus of, of the conversation in the documentary um, ha it has to do with this issue of the cultural mandate mm -hmm. or the dominion mandate, is, as it's also called. And, and it's, uh, you know, it's this calling to, to take dominion of the earth, to, to um, in that sense, pursue God's original calling for mankind. Right, that he right. gave to Adam and Eve in the garden, mm -hmm. and obviously sin and death, um, you know, threw a wrench in the in 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 the whole thing. But um, that is also being redeemed um, through the redemption of Christ. You know, this right. world is being redeemed, and we are called to, uh, uh, you know, participate in Christ's work of redemption and preaching of the gospel. But we are also called to participate in the redemption of, of the creation, you know, through, through the cultural mandate, through vocation, you know, having a calling in life. And, um, and, and if we deny that fact, and then we end up with this weird idea um, uh, to where, well, only if you're, you know, a minister of the gospel, are you really carrying out a Christian calling in this life? You know, mm -hmm. everybody else 
you know, the, we, there's ministers of the gospel, and then everybody else is just kind of, you know, didn't make the cut. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, you know, you, we need somebody needs to bake bread, I guess. So yeah, you man. know, you could do it, but it's not glorif- It's not spiritual. It's not glorifying to God or something like that. Like that's how a lot of people think. But that's right. Ultimately, you know, Paul said whether you eat or drink, you know, all to the glory of God. Right. And so it's it's. What, and and what's interesting about that point is that it means that all of us are engaged in the work of the kingdom. That's right. right? Not just a small select few. All Christians have a calling. All Christians have a vocation. All Christians are working together in building the kingdom. That's right. um, and yeah, ministers have a special role in that and, and, and all of that. I mean, but... Everybody else is also part of that kingdom building, right? Ultimately, and it's the pastor's job. My bad to cut you off, but it's the pastor's job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. But it's not just Wednesday night Bible study you're equipping them for. It's when they go to work. It's when they go home with their families. It's for everything. Matter of fact, I've been thinking like this lately. Like since we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a walking ministry. You, every Christian, he's giving you these skills to work, to, to, to make things better, to redeem. Like in Colossians, he said, he, he, made, he, he reconciled to himself all things, making peace by the blood of his cross. All things means all things. So, man, man, I'm getting rowdy. I'm, I, go ahead, brother, my fault. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, for sure. And and that's why, you know, I, the, my hope with this second project with Teach All Nations is, mm-hmm. is like, let's, let's talk, you know, practical here, yeah. right? Because yeah. uh, what does it mean for all of us? You know, and that's why we talk about vocation. That's why, you know, ha- haven't released the other episodes yet, but that's why we're going to talk about the family, right? Yeah. And fathers leading their families, yeah. and 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 um, and 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 just having that that um uh, that priestly role in their families That's right. that has been so lost in our day and age, yeah. and and talking about vocation, and talking about finances, and talking about you know just all these different areas that have to do with it, with taking dominion, which have to do. Um, with serving Christ in this life, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and it is, it's not that complicated in some ways, you know, it, it's like basic things, especially in our, cause we live in a time that, you know, it, a, there's a lot of areas that aren't that gray. It's pretty, it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. society's decayed enough to be like, yeah, it's probably, you know, probably not a good idea to be, you know, uh, you, you know, doing that or involved in that, you should right. probably uh, try something different. You know, yes. I mean, when uh, you, you know, when when public schools are 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 teaching that boys can be uh, bo- uh, girls and girls can be boys, yeah, you you, you might want to think about another, um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, form of education for your children. You know, so it's it's not even like it's not even that gray at no. this point. Like things have progressed to that that point basically. And so a lot of the stuff we talk about and a lot of the stuff, you know, uh, you know, different post mill pastors and, 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 uh, and folks are talking about, it's pretty straightforward, you know, which is, is nice. There's, there's a a, a very clear contrast between what we should be doing at this time and where the world is headed and what the world is doing these days. I think, I think also it left a vacuum by not proclaiming Christ's kingdom over all things. And it, and it brought about um, this woke stuff with these leftists thinking that you can you can put Marxism in progressive politics to take that over. So Christ is king over justice. So submit the government, the police, all that. Police like you're policing for the Lord, Jesus Christ. And that's the answer to that problem. You know what I mean? Every problem is a gospel answer that Christ mm. submit, submit to the king and, and watch how it thrives. So it's, it, now we're getting into theonomy, but I, we, I don't know if we got time for that. But like God's law brings about thriving for 
for his justice, but also for the gospel, because I'm stealing this from somebody. When, when man's law lines up with God's law, it not only convic- convicts you of crime, but convicts you of sin. And then we got the answer to that too. Christ mm. on the cross and resurrection. But mm-hmm. man, we, we might land the plane here, brother. We've been going for an hour, but I'm like, man, I'm gonna have to have you back on because I love talking <laughs> to you, dude. Give me rowdy. Yeah, we, uh, we, we have a lot to talk about for yes, sure. These yes. these subjects go, it's crazy. go for a bit. <laughs> it's crazy. But yeah, man, all, at the end of the day, Christ is king over everything movies music whatever you can think of sports that's his grass that you're running on that's his air that you're breathing he made you an athlete he knit you together in your mother's womb you can't do nothing without him i mean he created it all i mean it it's our it it, you know it's our father's world right um i always go back to colossians all things are made through christ and for christ and he holds all things together take a breath that's Jesus' mm. breath. <laughs> yeah. yeah, wrap it up. Tell them how to get to your stuff, man, and we'll put a link up um, as well. Sure, yeah. So right now, um, you can, um, what well, we could find my, my first film, uh, um, On Earth As It Is In Heaven, um, on YouTube, on Amazon, on the Canon Plus app. Uh, but the easiest way, you could just go, to, I think it's On Earth, uh, on earth film dot net. Um, that's my website and there's links to, to watch. You can even watch it right there or, or watch it on one of those other options. And there's also a link there to the lure site, which is lure.tv right now it's in uh, beta version. And so you can, um, uh, uh, if, if you know somebody who, who has a, a, a beta subscription, uh, or or um, they 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 have a few invites every week to send out. So if you want to watch the first two episodes are up, and you could find out more about that on on Lore TV. Um, and there's another three episodes, you know, coming down the the, the pipes, and that should be out uh, hopefully in the next few weeks on Lore. So um, so that's the the Teach All Nations, and and then the and uh, I, you know invite you guys to watch the first film. Um, it, it'll help to watch the first film before watching yeah. this uh, second series. Yeah. But yeah, that's where you can find uh, most of what I'm doing uh, these days. Man, bless you, brother. Keep taking dominion for the king, man, by the power of his spirit. Appreciate you coming on. Reform Yinja, we are out. Thanks, brother. Yeah.